What? Oh god. Why is that boss music playing? Where is my where is my team? Oh no, 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 no. Dark Tide is an incredible game. You can fight alongside three other friends to fight back against the forces of chaos. You can use magic to kill a big diarrhea monster. And also Joe Biden is there. But when you overcome the odds and beat these monsters, rejoicing and running to the healing station, Joe Biden is standing suspiciously still. The moment you go to heal, your camera flies through the bottom of the map and you are booted to the character select screen. Joy turns to anger and you're reminded of why this game is simultaneously so fun yet so frustrating. Dark Tide is a game I have complicated feelings about. Let me draw you an analogy. Imagine you're at a bar and watching a guy sing karaoke. You can tell he's a really talented singer. He's belting it out. You could listen to him all night, and you almost do. Problem is, this guy is blasted. He has had 17 whiskey cokes and he doesn't care who knows about it. He's stumbling all over. He's shitting his pants. He's landing some really sweet notes on Freebird, but then he's puking all over the people at the nearby table and you're worried you're next to be in the blast zone. That's how I feel about the design and presentation of Dark Tide. The core gameplay is so fun. If you like horde shooters, if you like anything related to Warhammer 40k, you will love this game. The melee combat, the range combat, the way the lore works into the environments and the characters and the objectives, the weapons, mwah, they are all extremely satisfying. But it's like being there with that guy singing karaoke. You're laughing it up, you're thoroughly entertained for the good first half of the night, but the more you listen, the more difficult it gets to avoid noticing that he has thoroughly soiled his pants. The character creation system is weak, except for the intro, the cutscenes are weak. The plot is weak, and NPCs you interact with are soulless and uninteresting, with one Mechanicus Mommy exception. Success achieved. You are permitted a five second celebration before extraction. And because the player characters are customizable, much of the dialogue and the banter between players are interchangeable boilerplate responses that are unsatisfying and overall weak. The one thing I know for sure is that you can trust nobody or nothing. I wonder what dark events there's an interesting prologue where the game tricks you into thinking that you might have some of these features in some satisfying way, such as a story or characters you could get to know and bond with, but then the game throws you into a damp, dark shopping mall of a hub world that tacitly reminds you that the only meaningful choices in life are to either buy things with fake money, real money, or to go on a randomized mission that feels detached from any main overarching goal. There are good reasons to buy Dark Tide right now that make it worth the $40 price point. All the bones that make a good horde shooter are there and are satisfying, but the game was obviously released too early. Many aspects of the game are not fleshed out or are poorly implemented. They are rushing to fix bugs as we speak and add new content in a desperate plea to raise the Steam score from where it's at now, at about 60% as of writing this. In short, Dark Tide has given me hours of entertainment and gameplay that I adore yet simultaneously is a sloppy drunk that I kind of have a hard time looking at. This is usually the part of the video where I tell the audience that I love the game wholeheartedly and I want to tell them why they should play it. So should you play Dark Tide? Maybe. And I want to tell you why. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you in this video all the things I loved about this game, all the things I hated about it, and all the things that made me feel conflicted. Before that, I need to address a couple of things and get them out of the way. First, People ask me, Varrock, is this game as good as Vermintide 2? The answer to that is no. But you know what else isn't as good as Vermintide 2? Vermintide 2, when it came out, combat did not function as intended, and the game went through several major overhauls to get to the point it's at today. It became a comeback success over time. But, you know, it's like Miyamoto said, a bad game, if delayed, can be good. A rushed game is bad forever. Except for Fallout New Vegas, Stellaris, Warframe, No Man's Sky, Sid Meier's Civilization 5, Sid Meier's Civilization 6, Vermintide 2, and maybe Dark Tide as well. We'll see, bro. I don't know yet. Vermintide 2 became an entirely different experience given some time. I believe, and hope, that Dark Tide is going to do the same. So if you're not convinced about buying the game right now, I think the smart decision is probably to wait about a year. Maybe two. Second, 
I will be resisting the urge to hop on any form of mindless bandwagon about the game, be it positive or negative. I've seen enough of it already and I'm sick of it. You're gonna hear me praise Darktide wholeheartedly where it deserves it, and go into a caustic fit of gamer words when the game has earned that as well. If you're here wanting me to endlessly praise the game, or just to completely tear into it as if it has no redeeming qualities, I'm afraid you're in the wrong place. But I invite you to stay and hear me out. There's a lot of interesting things about this game that are worth talking about. Now this is a game based on Warhammer 40k. For those of you unaware, Warhammer 40k is a masculine strategic war combat simulator tabletop hobby game where you, uh, buy your little army men dolls and <laughs> spend a lot of time painting them with all your favorite special colors and then play house with them very violently versus another manly man set of toys. It's a great time, I highly recommend it. Warhammer 40k has an absolutely absurd amount of lore. If you're a big nerd about it, you will love all the little details that they included for it in Darktide. For those of you who don't know anything about it, let me give you a very generalized and brief version of just the stuff you need to know for this game. Now, 40k fans, I need you to calm down, because I know normally you might be like, oh, you missed this part, or you should have talked about this, but I'm going to generalize and sum it up a lot, because otherwise trying to explain anything about Warhammer goes like this. Okay, so he's kind of half dead, sitting on a golden throne right now. He was okay before the whole his heresy but now he's sort of just sitting there and people have to be sacrificed to him all the time and it's a big mess what was that about the horse heresy H horsey heresy all right get out of here horse heresy go ahead get get back to the garage horse heresy so here's all you need to know about Warhammer 40k for Dark Type. Humans, we got a huge space empire on a bunch of planets. We worship a great big huge guy in a great big huge yellow chair. He's the God Emperor. He's sorta of still alive, but not really, and we made a religion out of him even though he very politely asked us not to. We are under constant threat from all sorts of non-human space bullshit. Basically, in our first contact with aliens, they were like, Hi, we come in peace, and we were like, Things that look different for me! Ah! Die! 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 All right, well, some of them did not come in peace and maybe deserved it. Actually, most of them. All of them. Glory to the God Emperor. So one of those evil space bullshits I mentioned, and the main threat of Dark Tide setting, is the Chaos God Nurgle. Nurgle is a corrupting force of pestilence and disease. He has taken the Empire planet of Atoma Prime and its people under his control, using the Chaos Emeralds to give them all his special sauce version of the Koof that turns them into zombies. But nastier, with boils and pus and a big ol' thing sticking out of your head. It's real bad. And we, the Imperium of Man, need an Inquisitor to come deal with this shit. Inquisitors, hypothetically, act out the God Emperor's will and root out heresy, like aliens, mutants, demons, and anything else that looks different from us. Usually, when a planet gets this bad, the Inquisitor would make the call to simply glass the planet. Just nuke it from orbit. But Atoma Prime is too important. And, uh, all the other guys, like the Space Marines and the regular Marines and the everybody else, they're all busy today. Inquisitor really needs some guys to go on some missions on this God Emperor Forsaken planet, though, so he's down to scraping the bottom of the barrel for anybody who can hold a gun. Even criminals, mutants, and mutant criminals. That's you! <laughs> You play as a convicted felon. Somehow, somewhere, you have betrayed the God Emperor's will. Well, probably. In a choice between being slave labor, getting executed, or going on missions to help clear out the planet, you evidently chose the last one. A lot of these missions you're going on involve near certain death. I describe it with a certain phrase used in a movie title with a Jared Leto Joker that's got damage written on his forehead, but saying one of those funny little words might get me demonetized. Uh, squad? Yeah, 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 that's it, squad. So let's just abbreviate it to SS. You are the SS in this game. <laughs> the Jared Leto one, not the, uh, <laughs> Not the funny mustache guy one. You have four choices of convict. Veteran sharpshooters were soldiers of the Empire. Zealots were citizens of the Empire. But insanely religious for the God Emperor, to the point where it's kind of embarrassing and a liability to the official church. Ogrins are abhumans that have actual rocks bouncing around inside their head but are very strong and very loyal. Psychers are space wizards that are usually outcasts in society, even when they're not convicts, because they have the potential to squeeze your brain out of your ears by looking at you. Are they all fun to play? Yes. Are they all balanced? Not even close. More on that later. So, you pick one of the four classes. 
Unlike Vermintide, which had five pre-made characters, Darktide has you customize your character and their tragic backstory. What was your home planet? What was your childhood like? How about your life as you grew up? What was your defining moment in your life that formed you as a person? Think about all these things deeply, very deeply. Secure it in your mind. And then... Throw it out the fucking window because none of it matters! See these personality options? These determine your character's voice. Your entire character background is actually pre-built secretly into this one singular choice of personality. Your character will never, ever mention anything about the background you spent time deliberating on. It will never be mentioned by NPCs, or in the story, or by other player characters. There's only one exception to this, and it's if you choose Katie as your homeworld as the sharpshooter. You get the personality called the Cutthroat, which has the opposite problem, who never shuts the hell up about Katie. Every other personality and background is completely interchangeable. Why even bother showing the player all these backstory options when you're going to completely ignore what they choose? Two different players with entirely different backgrounds but the same personality choice will say the exact same voice lines. I've seen some people say that voice lines referencing background choices do exist, but they're rare. I have never heard a background specific line for any of my four characters in my near 100 hours of gameplay. These voice lines either don't exist or are so rare they may as well not be there at all. Now, in an ironic way, Darktide hand-waving away your entire background story you chose as irrelevant and unimportant is actually completely appropriate for the setting. After all, you're a convict, a reject. Your superiors don't care who you are, where you're from, they just want you to get the job done. Several NPCs specifically say as much, referencing that they've seen too many of you die to care to learn your faces. You're just another nameless moron being thrown into the meat grinder of 40k's dim reality. But as accurate as this is for the setting, it is obviously not intentional. There are two ways that they could address this. The first is the lame but easy option. Everything about your character is already completely prepackaged into the voice, so just make it more obvious so that you don't waste the player's time. Or, my preferred but higher effort option, get those voice actors back into the studio to record a metric shit ton of voice lines. What's your name, soldier? Crawl from Cadia. Crawl from Cadia, you're not from Cadia anymore. <laughs> Have way more voice lines referencing all the different backgrounds and let the characters play off of each other. You can still have this be setting appropriate, too. Have them reference their defining moment after surviving an intense fight. They banter about their differences in upbringing compared to their current situation. Then you could have their superiors chime in to shut them up and get them on with the mission, emphasizing their disposability still. It doesn't have to be frequent. The characters can still primarily talk about the mission and the people they work for, but it would be something more than what we currently have have, which is lies. This is all lies. Anyway, once you're finished with the character creation, you can play the prologue. The prologue involves a few cutscenes that set up who you're working for and why, and a single player sequence that plays like the intro to a campaign and functions as a tutorial. It's good, I like it. What I don't like is that it tricks the player into thinking that there will be a good story, or good cutscenes after these intro ones, or any sort of linear campaign of any plot importance, or that you'll ever meaningfully interact with an NPC ever again. More on that later. After the prologue, you're officially part of the crew. They don't fully trust you yet, but they'll let you do stuff for them. They need to indoctrinate you, so they have you go meet a living walkie-talkie that the Inquisitor talks through to tell you about your purpose in life. Go fight and die for Atoma Prime! I'm really, really busy, so I can't be there, but if you're ever doubting yourself or scared or trying to have any sort of coherent thought for yourself, just remember... Who am I? I'm a warrior! I am a warrior! Then you finally arrive in the main area of the ship you're on, the Morning Star, aka in the hub world. The hub world is bad. It is really, really bad. It feels like a rundown mall where you're about to get jumped at any given moment. Nobody visits it anymore except for the people who have to, because they either work at the only legitimate business left in the place, or because they're addicted to meth and their dealer works out of the abandoned hot topic next door. Here are the activities available in the hub world. Mission select to play the video game. A barber, who can change only the unimportant things about you. A weapons shop, which has a rotating selection of none of the weapons you want at that moment. 
moment. A clothing store that takes real money, owned and operated by the Chinese Mafia. A crafting store in which you cannot craft items. An unregistered fighting ring ran by a test tube baby. And a man who gives you contracts you'll never complete on time if you have a job. So fortunately, most of you will be fine. But this is where we get into the more fundamental examples of how Dark Tide does not respect your time. Everything in the hub world, basically everything outside the actual missions and core gameplay, is designed like a shitty mobile game trying to extract as much time out of you as possible. The weapons shop is a perfect example of this. Let's say you've been playing a few missions and you leveled up enough to use a new weapon. The Bolter. You want to use this beautiful gun so bad. But this is not Vermintide 2, where you get a chest at the end of every mission with three items in it. In fact, getting an item after completion of a mission in Darktide is something with a relatively low chance of happening. And that chance doesn't increase by playing harder difficulty levels or by performing better in the game. The crafting shop does not, as of release of this video, actually let you craft anything like weapons either. So, if you want to use that bolter, this weapon shop is your only reliable means of getting that weapon. But it's actually not reliable, because the store has a completely random selection of bullshit and it changes every hour. There is no guarantee that the weapon you're looking for will ever actually be here during the time you're playing. Dark Tide doesn't even expect you to grind. Worse, it expects you to literally kill time in real life. Go play some more missions or play fucking RuneScape or something, I don't know, because you're not getting that bolter unless you check back every hour. The weapon store in Darktide is like a restaurant with a constantly rotating menu of random food items every hour. Imagine you went to McDonald's for lunch. If you're American, you're probably already watching this video in a McDonald's, so this won't be hard to imagine. But you go up to the cashier and you're like, hey, can I get a cheeseburger? And the cashier's like, uh... We don't have that right now. And you're like, this is McDonald's. How do you not have a cheeseburger? When will you have a cheeseburger? And they're like, uh, I don't know. Maybe if you wait an hour, we'll have one. Do you want some like ketchup or water or something? And you're pissed, but you're like, okay, fine. I'll check back in an hour. After an hour passes, you go back and ask the cashier again. Can I get a cheeseburger? And he's like, Oh, uh, sorry, we still don't have cheeseburgers, but we, we might need another hour. Do you want some, like, mustard or napkins or something? At this point, you are in the position of either waiting again, walking out of the place, or just angrily accepting some fucking mustard and napkins instead. Except it's even worse than this, because in this analogy world, there is no other place on earth to find a cheeseburger! You can't buy one somewhere else, you can't even make them yourself, but you might get lucky purely on chance that you happen to find one on the ground outside. Extremely unfortunately, the mission select has the exact same Design. A random splattering of missions with varying difficulties, maps, objectives, and modifiers will be offered to you and refreshes after a certain real-time duration. You want to play a specific map on a specific difficulty? Well, tough shit, you better settle for that ketchup and water because you're not getting it unless you're lucky. The frustrating nature of this did not really become apparent to me until the game's first content update came out. This content update came out a couple weeks after the game's release and it came with a new map, it came with some new weapons, and I loved how it looked from the previews and I wanted to try it. Except, oops, I can't play it because the map is never in rotation when I'm playing the game. It has been over two weeks since the update came out as of writing this and I still haven't played the new fucking map because I can't. Imagine putting out a free map for your game and not letting your audience play it! <clears throat> anyway, the contract system is something you unlock after leveling up a bit. You're given weekly tasks you can complete to acquire a special currency. You can use that currency to acquire higher quality weapons than the regular weapon store. Randomized selection here too, by the way, for the weapons and the contracts available. There's even a re-roll button that you can use to shuffle some new contracts if you don't like your current ones too. Don't ask me why they didn't implement this for the weapons shop as well, because I couldn't tell you. But these contracts, they don't respect your time. 
Let me give you an example. Let's say you have the contract to do 25 missions in a week. In my experience, depending on the difficulty, a game takes anywhere from 25 to 50 minutes. Let's generously call it 30 minutes. 30 times 25, we're talking 750 minutes of playing the game this week minimum. The contract does not count any failures or the game crashing either, so that's all wasted time we're not even accounting for here. You only have so much time in the day to relax, and if you're like me, you like to play a couple different games during that time. Time. So this contract system sounds annoying, but not terribly insane. 12 hours, I mean, it's possible. Until you realize that these contracts and currency are locked to each character. Contracts and the currency you receive from it are not shared between characters you have. And they should be. Let's say you have four characters, one per class. If you have this exact 25 mission contract on just one other character, not even thinking about all four, you are being asked to dedicate 25 hours during the week to just play Dark Tide. Almost four hours per day. Minimum. Dark Tide does not respect your time. Oh, and just as another sweet example, sometimes you get contracts to complete a number of missions on a specific level, but remember, the mission select is random. You can't pick what level you want. I still haven't played the new fucking map! Let's talk about the cash shop. There's a place in Darktide, the Commodore's Vestures, where you can buy clothes for real money. They don't affect gameplay other than looking neat when you buy them. Now, you might be thinking, Varrock, these are just optional clothes. You don't have to buy them. And you're right. I don't, and I haven't. The cash shop does not offend me purely because of its existence. I have bought cosmetics before in other games, and I might have in Darktide had it not been this way. Plenty of games I enjoy, like Team Fortress 2, to have a shop where you can buy cosmetics that do not affect the gameplay. Where Dark Tide went wrong was in the implementation of its cash shop. I believe the way it was released was insulting, and I believe the way it behaves is predatory. Let me tell you why. First, to define a term I'm going to use a few times here. A person who spends an inordinate, unreasonable amount of money on microtransactions in video games is known as a whale. From my experience, whales are often using games as a coping mechanism to avoid much deeper issues stemming from their social lives or other underlying mental health issues. Ironically, it's these exact issues that make them easier to exploit with marketing techniques like fear of missing out or leftover change. More on that soon. So, the release of the cash shop was insulting how? Fat Shark, I love them, but they have a history of taking their games out of the oven too quickly. Vermintide 2, for example, did not have many features that it should have on release. However, when Dark Tide officially launched, it didn't just have incomplete features. Worse, it had incomplete features like crafting, but a completely functional cash shop. This is not a free game, by the way. It is a hypothetically finished product worth $40. But crafting doesn't work, guys, and you can't interact with and create weapons in the way you'd like because our weapons shop is randomized. You know, weapons, those things you play in the actual video game with. But don't worry, you can still buy hats! You think this is bad? This? This chicanery? No, it gets worse. You can't buy items for actual money with a fixed price like you couldn't Vermintide too. No, now we have Aquilas, another in-game currency that you buy with cash. There is no way to earn Aquilas in-game. On Dark Tide's release, if you were to buy Aquilas, they were specifically packaged in amounts that never matched up with the thing you wanted to buy. For example, a singular weapon skin might be 400 Aquilas. Guess what the smallest package of Aquilas you could buy on release was? 500 Aquilas. Want a whole set that gets you items from head to toe? That'll be 2400 Aquilas. What's the closest you can buy? Well, there's the 2100 Aquilas package that'll leave you with 300 short, or the 4500 Aquilas package where, after your purchase, you'll be left with... Oh! 2100 Aquilas! Go f Figure. Just enough left over so that you'll need to buy some more if you want another whole set. You worthless whale, you mentally ill goblin. Buy some more of our fucking fake coins to satisfy your OCD urges. Are you telling me that a cash shop just happens to turn out like that? No! When asked about this on Discord, one of the developers said, We are hoping to add a buy what you need feature. It's just immeasurably complex, so isn't gonna happen overnight. <laughs>
<laughs> now that's an immeasurably complex problem, letting players buy things for money. Now, it wasn't exactly what fans wanted, but somehow Fat Shark was able to figure out the rocket science to add a 2400 Aquilus package, you know, so that players could buy the exact amount for a full cosmetic set. You still can't buy things directly with money. You're still not buying the exact amount of Aquilus you need if you wanted, say, just half the set, because that would be... <laughs> immeasurably complex. Sorry. Still working on adding a 100 Aquilus package, but buying an item for a fixed amount of real money would just be <laughs> too complex. Immeasurably complex. So immeasurably complex, in fact, that their previous game had this exact feature! You could buy things at face value, fixed price, in Vermintide 2. Did all the developers responsible for that at Fashark just up and leave between Vermintide and Darktide? Did they all get assassinated? Fat Shark defecated through a sunroof! My final reason for my belief in the cash shop being predatory is how it exploits fear of missing out, or FOMO. Unlike Vermintide 2, which had a full and always available catalog full of items players could purchase at their leisure, Darktide's cash shop every 10 days rotates out all of its available items for a new selection. Will the items for this rotation ever be back again? Who knows? Oh god, you don't want to be left out when everybody else has a cool skin and might never be available again. Better buy it now, whale! This, just like the amounts of Aquilus being sold, was so loudly complete complained about by fans that Fat Shark was forced to act. So a couple of weeks after the game's release, they addressed the shop in the game's signal update, stating that they had removed the timer from the cash shop until it reaches 24 hours remaining. Then the timer reappears again. I would argue that this is actually worse, because people who are weak to FOMO as a marketing strategy have now even less information and more reason to worry about when the items are gonna be gone forever. That is to say, the key issue here is not the timer itself. It is the fact that the cash shop rotates. Fat Shark, in this same update, addressed the rotation versus having a full catalog idea, stating, We feel that unlimited store pages are likely to create confusion and a bad user experience. Rest assured, the cosmetics are not gone forever and will likely reappear. You're so right. You're so right. Unlimited store pages are so confusing. When I'm able to see exactly what I want to buy whenever I want, like in Vermintide 2, I just just get so confused that I forget where my wallet is. When I walk into a grocery store, I become absolutely overwhelmed by the amount of options at my disposal. Again, did all the Vermintide 2 developers just up and leave during production of Darktide? They know a lot of their audience is Warhammer fans, right? Take a look at the 40k wiki, or any aspect of the tabletop game. These people are not fans of simplicity. They are not easily confused. This is not Fortnite, and your audience is not primarily 14-year-olds, Fat Shark, and I know you know this. I know the people at Fat Shark know this because they are Warhammer fans. And about the second part of their statement, likely reappear? It feels like they wanted to calm the rioting with the first half of the sentence, don't worry, they aren't gone forever. Then with the second half of the sentence, they keep all the whales with FOMO on the hook by saying that the items will just likely reappear. What the hell does that even mean? Why is there not a full catalog you can buy from? Just to take advantage of these whales, keep them on the hook, stealing the blind. What a sick joke. Now I'm gonna engage in a bit of speculation here, so take this as you will. I'm reaching deep into my gut, scrambling around my intuition with my fingers a little bit and pulling out a theory. Regardless of how well it works in practice, I believe the time-wasting mechanics in Darktide are intended to hook whales. The weapon you want isn't in the shop now, so you kill time by playing a couple missions. The contracts are absurdly long, but if you really have a fixation with completion and making numbers go up, you might just get them done for your favorite character. Your time gets wasted and you become attached to your status and time investment in the game, which makes you more likely to become highly emotionally invested in it, which makes you more likely to spend money on the cash shop. I don't like it. Not at all. I've ranted enough about this, so let me be absolutely clear. 
I don't think having a cash shop or having microtransactions are inherently unethical. These are just clothes and they don't affect gameplay. What feels wrong to me are the aspects of Darktide's cash shop that I believe are predatory, such as the inability to earn Aquilas through gameplay, the FOMO rotation style of everything in the hub world, and the time-wasting mechanics that I believe are all connected to this process. And some might say, Varrock, these types of predatory cash shops are common now. Other games do it too. And to that I say, stop playing Fortnite. You don't have to accept this. This is not a free-to-play Zoomer game. This is a Warhammer 40k property that already cost $40 to buy on Steam. It has a successful predecessor in Vermintide 2 that gave it the perfect blueprint for an ethical cash shop, and for some reason, it did not adopt anything from that model. Optimistically, and maybe naively, I have higher expectations for Fat Shark and for Dark Tide than this, and I would like to see the things I've ranted at length about changed in the future someday. Will it be changed? Who knows. But God, I hope. Because for all of this nonsense that you're exposed to, starting with the hub world, if you can dig through it, there is a real gem of a game beneath it. Now some of you might be wondering, Varrock, how could you possibly compliment this game after you just screamed about it for the last 15 minutes? All I can say to that is that this game gives me all of those emotions at once. I feel very strongly negatively about some parts of this game, and I feel very strongly positively about other parts. It's hard for me to say that the negative aspects don't sour the whole package, but it doesn't mean that the good parts aren't worth praising. So it's time to praise this game where it's earned it before I do any more complaining. One of Darktide's greatest strengths is its hybrid combat. Darktide takes everything that made the melee combat satisfying in Vermintide, makes it feel more impactful, then goes a step further by integrating ranged combat more wholly into the regular gameplay. Ranged weapons in Vermintide are fun, but for the most part, you sort of just whip them out whenever you see a special enemy, fire once, and then put it away until you see the next one. In Darktide, you're encouraged to use both your melee and your ranged weapons on all sorts of enemies, not just the special ones. You see a group of enemies shooting at you from a distance, you start firing back. One of your ogrens rushes in, gets him into melee combat, now you rush in with your knife. Another enemy spawns and shooting at you from a distance. You're switching back and forth all the time, and I love it. The maps and enemies in this game are designed around this hybrid combat. Maps have plenty of cover for both you and the Nurgle worshippers. Not all mobs have ranged weapons, but the ones that do will switch between their weapons just like you, depending on the situation. For example, if you bum rush a group of cultists that are hiding behind cover who are shooting at you, the moment you come near them, you will force them to engage with you in melee combat instead. They'll pull out their melee weapons and fight you that way instead of shooting at your teammates. I think it's a good evolution of the way that combat was in Vermintide. It takes everything about that and adds a little more. You can tell which regular enemies have ranged weapons based on a rule I call the Gucci Socks principle. The more clothes they have, the more dangerous they are. Trash mobs that are dressed in rags will simply run at you with knives and try to swarm you. Enemies with just a cool Gucci bathrobe might engage you at a distance with a rifle when they spot you. Enemies gucci down to the socks, like these guys, have rifles as well as armor, so they're harder to kill. Anything that makes weird noises or is larger than a human is a special enemy probably worth focusing on before the regular mobs. I really like the variety of enemies in Darktide and how the game encourages you to use your entire toolkit pretty evenly throughout the mission to deal with them. So you'll frequently be swapping between different weapons and attack styles based on the number, size, and proximity of the threat, which makes the combat intense and engaging. Speaking of toolkits, let's talk about the weapons. The weapons in Darktide are amazingly satisfying to use. Now, I might be a little biased because I like 40k stuff, but this game just represents 40k weapons so well. Never have I played a game that made me smile so much just by firing a last gun or by revving up a chainsword or turning on the power sword so that you can cleave through an entire crowd with it. Never have I played a game that made the bolter sound and feel so good, especially when you're hip firing. Watch Each operative you can play as gets a melee weapon and a ranged weapon of your choice, along with a special ability and a grenade specific to each class. Now, I don't know who designed the grenades for each class at Fat Shark, but they deserve a promotion. The veteran sharpshooter gets frag grenades. Normal, useful, 
Makes sense. He's a soldier, right? But then there's the zealot. You'd think the zealot would have like a I don't know a Molotov cocktail or something because it's it's cheap. I mean they're they're not exactly professionals and they cleanse with fire. You know that whole thing. No, the zealot has a <laughs> goddamn flashbang. Why do they have flashbangs? Who gave these to them? I have no idea. But they're fun as hell to use, so I am not complaining. Now the psyker doesn't get grenades and instead has an ability called brain burn. You point it at an enemy, you clench your hands together real tight, and then their brain explodes out of their skull. Amazing. And Ogren. Oh. <laughs> oh, Ogren. My sweet, stupid, bouncing, beautiful idiot baby boy. Ogren takes the entire box of grenades he was given by whoever geared him up in munitions, aims it, and lobs the whole fucking thing at an enemy. And the Ogren is just so strong that this is some of the hardest hitting single target damage in the entire game. The Zealot, Psyker, and Sharpshooter can all use certain weapons, such as the Revolver, but then they all have their own unique class-specific weapons too. The Ogren is the exception to this and has entirely class-specific weapons because they would sooner eat a human-sized revolver than know how to fire it. Ogren's notable weapon Weapons include riot shields, big slappy sticks, and an explosive device that lets you punch deposit a grenade right into the guy in front of you. The Zealot's notable weapons are melee weapons like the two-handed chainsword that lets them more efficiently act like the insane parking lot crackhead that they aspire to be for the Emperor. The Psyker gets to play Palpatine and shoot lightning out of their hands, as well as amp up a sword with brain explosion juice. And the Sharpshooter's notable special weapons are the Plasma Gun, which I want to be good because it just looks so cool, and the Power Sword, which upon equipping it turns you into the best class in the game. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that section where I unabashedly praise the game because now it's time for me to complain again! By completing missions, you'll gain levels in trust. Literally, your level of how much your superiors trust you. The higher your trust, the fancier toys they'll let you play with. You can go on harder missions, access services like the, uh, contracts. Yay. Every few levels you gain, upon returning from a mission, you'll be informed that you are being summoned to somewhere for a cutscene. Especially compared to the fantastic intro and prologue cutscenes, these trust cutscenes range from underwhelming to useless. The story of the game is told through these cutscenes, but it's a story so sparse and lacking importance that nothing in the game experience would change were you to just remove them entirely. I'm gonna run through all the cutscenes real quick. If you really care about spoilers, skip ahead about a minute, but it doesn't matter, there's nothing here. We don't trust you, you better go on missions to prove yourself. Here's weapons and contracts. Still don't trust you though, you better do more missions. There's a traitor on the ship, could be anybody. Prove yourself by doing missions. Hi, we are MILFs of varying organic properties and we don't trust you. Do more missions and we will hire you as a pool boy. We're still looking for the traitor by the way, you better do more missions so we know you're not the traitor. Okay, we narrowed it down to two people, I wonder who the traitor is. Oh god, I'm so tense, I wonder if it's me. We figured it out, it's not the player. Cool, we trust you now. Since we trust you now, could you go do some fucking bitch for us? Thanks! Of course I'm gonna do more missions. There's nothing else to do here! That's fine, by the way. Going on missions should be the main focus of the game. But it is hilariously repetitive to have every single NPC on board. Some of them more than once. Tell you to go prove yourself by doing the thing you're already doing. But nothing changes. The fact that there's a traitor on board or not affects none of the gameplay, and it doesn't tie into to any of the missions you go on either. It would be kind of cool to have specific levels made for certain trust milestones like the prologue, where it's a structured experience that ties into the plot somehow, but as it stands, you could straight up remove these cutscenes and nothing would change. The last thing I want to touch on is the four different operatives or classes. As I mentioned earlier, they're not very well balanced. There are four operatives to play as, the Sharpshooter, the Psyker, the Zealot, and the Ogren. A difficult Difficulties 1 through 3, in my experience, they all feel relatively balanced and fun to play. Difficulties 4 and 5 are where things go off the rails. It's at these difficulties that something becomes clear. Sharpshooter does everything better than everybody else, and Psyker does everything worse than everybody else. Everything Psyker can do that's worth doing generates peril. 
which can kill you if it gets to 100%. But these peril generating abilities are no more useful or powerful than the abilities available to other classes. Why would I spend time brain bursting something twice? Something that generates large amounts of peril, takes a while to charge and complete, and I'm vulnerable while doing it, when I could simply shoot them in the head with a gun. The only real advantage brain burst provides is that you can lock it onto an enemy and then hide behind cover while completing it, or, you know, guaranteed get damage on them if you're bad at aiming. But this is a negligible advantage. Veteran does not need to take cover. He shoots them in the head with a gun, and then they're not shooting him anymore. They're dead. And why would I use Psyker's magic sword when I could use literally any other weapon that has a special charge-up attack like any other class? They all basically do the same thing. You hit a button, you rev it up for big damage. But Psyker's big damage rev up thing generates peril when he wants to activate it, and when he does a block push. Peril can kill you! Just play anybody else. Play a zealot or play a sharpshooter, both of them get the chain sword. You can rev it up, you can turn it off as many times as you want, doesn't cost you anything. Thing. Zealot's got a two-handed version of it. Sharpshooter's got a power sword. Even Ogren's got a big electric mace thing. You turn it on, you whack somebody with it. Free big hit, no peril. Here's my contention. Peril should not be removed from the game. It's not terribly difficult to manage, but it should be something that offsets a powerful ability. Psyker has the worst of both worlds right now. He has weak abilities and downsides from using them. Sharpshooter is the opposite of Psyker. Everything Sharpshooter does is strong, efficient, and completely free. He has more toughness than an Ogryn and can regenerate it faster. He has more sustained and burst damage at range than a Psyker. He also has the strongest melee weapon in the game, the Power Sword, outclassing the Zealot's role as a melee DPS. However, Sharpshooter is so fun to play. I don't want him to get nerfed. I want every Everyone else to get buffed, make this game crazy as hell. Even if you have to supercharge some of the enemies to do it, or make the difficulties different. Ogren should be tougher, Zealot should be more mobile. Ogren and Zealot together should have better melee weapons than Psyker and Sharpshooter, just on principle of their role on a team alone. Psyker's peril generating ability should be buffed, or have the peril generated be reduced. Brain Burst should deal its damage in increments so that it isn't wasted when something kills your target. I would think balanced class variety at all difficulty levels can only be good for the game's longevity. More than any drip-fed microtransactions or content updates with new maps that you can't even play. Darktide is a conflicting game for me. I love the core of the good video game that exists here, but unfortunately that core is buried under mounds and piles of terrible nonsense. You'll enjoy the game if you're a diehard fan of 40k or horde shooters already, but I really can't recommend the game in its current state to a wider audience, and that makes me a bit sad. I want to see Darktide succeed someday and come back around. The goal of this video is not to encourage people to go dunk on the developers or to go leave a bunch of nasty reviews. Don't worry, that's effectively already been done. The game has rightfully earned its current mixed review score on Steam and belongs exactly where it is until it shows signs of improvement. Fat Shark, you got a bad habit of overpromising and underdelivering and breaking things and being Swedish, but you also made Vermintide 1 and 2. And for that, I hold on to some sort of hope, even if it seems misguided to some. My pleading message to Fat Shark is this. Please continue to work on Darktide and make it a much better game, like you did with Vermintide 2. One that I can come back to someday and give a much more positive review. Hey there, thanks for sticking around to the end here. I know this was a bit different than my other videos, but uh, old Varrock had to get some things off of his chest about this game. So I hope you enjoyed listening to my unhinged ranting as much as my neighbors did. I appreciate you all sticking around this far. So thank you all very much. And a very special thank you to my shady cabal of Vidya elites and connoisseurs. Your blood money funds production of these videos. Thanks to you guys, more reviews to come. And about games I think you'll find very interesting. I love you all very much. Thanks again, and see you next time.